great privilege to be asked this morning to come and to deliver the opening devotional from Isaiah chapter 58. And so if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Isaiah 58. The text that's been given to me is verses 1 through 12 of the 58th chapter. Please follow along as I read this morning Isaiah 58. Verses 1 through 12. Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted, and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast you seek your own pleasure, and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel, and to fight, and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day, will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your desire in scorched places, and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruin shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundation of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets to dwell in it. I ask that you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, in keeping with both the letter and the spirit of this text, it is our aim to have conviction, a conviction for which dull and lazy words will be useless, but a conviction for which even the most powerful words will be meaningless, unless your Spirit comes this morning to minister to us through the Word. O oh, Holy Spirit, may you blow like wind and burn like fire, and may you come to do that convincing and convicting work for which you have been sent from the Father and Son. Lord, we pray that in all of these things, even this morning as we meet, that the Lord Jesus would be glorified in our midst. In his name we pray. Amen. I did something rather unusual this morning. I got up before the break of dawn, and I took the occasion to go outside and to watch as the sun began to rise. And I have to admit that it's been a number of years since I've done that. In a household of five children, we covet every moment of sleep we can possibly get. 
But I was reminded this morning as I did that what a remarkable thing it is to watch the sun rise. To see it as it crests above the horizon and it drives away the darkness and it dispels the nighttime. And I was struck this morning as I saw that with the awareness that not only was I watching the dawning of the sun, but in a very real sense, I was watching the dawn of near invincible might. There is almost nothing in existence that can stop the sun from rising. Only God himself can hinder its approach. Only God himself can slow its advance and fetter its rising. It comes and it cannot be stopped. And as I thought upon that, I was struck. Because that is, in a very real sense, the picture that the prophet Isaiah gives to us in this text of the fullness of God's covenantal blessings in Jesus Christ. In verse 8, we read these words, Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. And your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Light, healing, righteousness, glory. These are, in a few short words, a description of the fullness of the covenant blessings that have been promised to us. And Isaiah says, then, then shall your light break forth like that rising sun and none shall be able to stop its appearing. And Isaiah was given this word specifically because the house of Jacob at this time had been deprived, you might say, of an enjoyment and an experience of those blessings because of their sin. Though all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Yet we must remember, brothers, that we forfeit an actual enjoyment of those blessings. We can forfeit an actual experience and the comfort of those blessings on account of sin. What a mighty tragedy sin is. Because it seeks to rob us of the promise. It seeks to rob us of the comfort and the enjoyment of our inheritance. And as I think about that and as I've meditated on this text, I cannot escape that dreadful thought when I look at the state of the church in our own time and in our own place. When you see in every corner of Christianity in our society, nothing it seems so often but weakness and powerlessness. When you see from the church fruitlessness in a church that seems largely ineffectual. And we want to point the fingers and blame everything. We want to blame society. Well, it's not the society of my parents anymore. We want to blame politics and political candidates for their platforms. We want to blame ideologies. We want to blame a culture that is continuing to descend into unrighteousness. But brothers, let me ask this question. What if it's not society's fault? But what if it is our sin that has robbed us of the enjoyment of the blessings that Christ has procured for us? And so this morning as we come to this text, my question is simple. How do we do it? How do we as the RPCNA get the result of verse 8? How do we here in our time and our place long for and strive for that state of covenant blessing where our light will break forth like the dawn. And it's to that that I want to turn our thoughts this morning. And in being a good Presbyterian, I have three points. 
And in perhaps being a better Presbyterian, they are in an alliteration for those of you who like that. My first point will be a focus on the prophet's demeanor. My second point will be the people's duplicity. And my third point, the Lord's delight. And so our first observation this morning from this text is the prophet's demeanor. And I don't want to linger long here, but I want to draw to your attention the manner in which the prophet Isaiah was to go to the people. And we see that in verse 1. We see the commission and the charge that the Lord gives to him in verse 1, cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Cry aloud. It's a very emphatic expression. Quite literally it means, as some people have, have translated it, use the full stretch of your voice. Strain your throat. Lift up your voice with volume and with power and with vehemency. And don't hold back in this one thing the Lord tells the prophet. Don't hold back, but declare to my people their transgression. And I, I bring that to your attention this morning. Because it has often been noted that the precursor to the New Testament preacher is not the Greek orator in his lecture hall, but the precursor of the New Testament preacher is the Hebrew prophet. And I know many of you have often prayed, and it is my prayer as well, that in our day we would have a prophetic-like witness. Don't we need this kind of attitude? Don't we need this kind of spirit? Don't we need this kind of demeanor today? Brothers, where are the Jeremiah's of our generation? Men who with weeping eyes and tear-stained cheeks will cry out against the sins of the church. Where are the Ezekiel's who dominated by the presence of God go forth with courage to declare the sins of this people? Where are the Isaiahs who compelled by a vision for the holiness of God go forth to an unclean people and lift up their voice like a trumpet and do not hold back? Brothers, is this not what we desperately need in our own day? What we have to say, let me be very clear, what we have to say cannot be said in a whisper, and it ought not to be said in a whisper. And it ought not because all around us, the people of God are being deafened by the volume of sin. And sin is seeking to muffle spiritual ears and to drown out all other things. And brothers, what we desperately need is loud and serious and relentless proclamation. With the courage and the boldness of a lion, even the lion of the tribe of Judah, to break into all the noise of sin and to still its voice. It is not without purpose. That Jesus himself has said what you hear in a whisper. Proclaim from the housetops. There will be no blessing for the church of Jesus Christ. With muted proclamation. And silent pulpits. O oh, brothers, cry aloud and do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and declare to my people their transgression. It's the demeanor of the prophet. But secondly, this morning, and perhaps more importantly, we have the people's duplicity. People's duplicity. Why is it that the Lord wants Isaiah to go in this manner? Why does the Lord tell Isaiah to raise his voice and, and, and to proclaim with vehemency? Why does he say that? Well, he says it because this people, as we see in these verses, is dominated by hypocrisy. I 
hope and trust this morning that you know what the definition of hypocrisy is. To have the appearance, but to lack the reality. To have the outward show, but to lack that which is inward. And the key to seeing this, the key to understanding this, is really found in verse 2. Where the Lord says, Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. And here are the two key words. As if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. As if. The picture that's being painted here is of a, of a people who make the appearance of the truth of religion, who make the appearance of worship. But the Lord himself comes with that stinging indictment that though they seek him and delight to know his ways, they are a people as if. As if they did this. And, and it's a stinging rebuke to say, but they're not. They're not. They have all of the appearance, but they lack the reality. And it is this, brothers, that calls for the strongest of human words and calls for all the strength that human words can muster, cry aloud, here is the transgression of the house of Jacob. They are a duplicitous people. And I remind you of that this morning and bring it to your attention because in the catalog of sin there is perhaps no sin that is as wicked and dangerous as that of a double heart. To be an angel in form but the devil in heart. To be an apostle in name but to be a traitor in the night. And God is saying through the prophet that that is what is characteristic of this people. They are duplicitous. They have a double heart. They are hypocrites who have the appearance but lack the reality and we will miss the force and the power of this passage if we simply take it as a history lesson. But we must be driven to ask, is it true of us? Could the same charge be leveled against us as a corporate body? That though we seek him daily and delight to know his ways, yet we are a people as if, who have all the appearances but lack the reality. Well, this duplicity shows itself in a number of ways, and it shows itself first in outward forms. Again, we see that in verse 2. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. Here we have this picture, as I've already said, that is being painted of, of the house of Jacob, that in one sense they seek God. In one sense they're going after him and they're claiming to delight in a knowledge of his ways. But, but the tragedy of this is that at the end of the day, they're really just pretending. They're pretending to desire him. They're pretending to go after his presence. They're pretending to have an interest in a holy life. But at the end of the day, it is all for nothing because they lack the reality. I heard the story of a man once who, who went to a well. And he was parched with thirst and he cast the bucket into the opening of the well and he went to draw it up. And, and as he pulled the bucket up, he found that the bucket was completely empty. And so in some frustration, he threw the bucket into the well again and he drew it up again, hoping maybe this time I'll get water. And he did it a third time and each time that bucket came up empty. And, and what do you suppose the man did? He walked away cursing the well as a useless thing. It was not without purpose that the Apostle Peter speaks of hypocrites in that language. That they are wells without water. They have the form of that which glitters, but it is not gold. And why? Because they've forgotten. 
They've forgotten that it all begins with the heart. That when God regulates his worship, and I know we're a denomination that believes God regulates his worship, that the first place where God begins is to regulate your heart. And Isaiah is saying this people has no heart. It's not to say that the outward doesn't matter. The Lord doesn't rebuke them for their fasting. He doesn't rebuke them for their observation of religious ordinances. But what it is saying is that it's our hearts animated by the Holy Spirit that gives life to our worship. Without which we have nothing but dead form. Brothers, don't give prayers to God. Without praying with your hearts. Don't fast as we are calling people to do in this synod week together. Without fasting first and foremost in your hearts. Woe to us if we are a people who observe outward forms. But lack all the inward reality. The duplicity shows itself. Not only in outward forms but in self-deception. We see that come out in verse 3. Here's an interesting question. Why have we fasted and you see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Isn't that interesting that these people are asking that question? They're, they're going to the Lord and they're challenging him and they're saying, Lord, we fasted. So why don't you see it? Lord, we've humbled ourselves. So why do you seem to have no knowledge of it? Here is a horrific picture, if I can put it in those terms, a horrific picture of a people who are deceived, who think they're doing well, and there is in a very real sense an arrogant confusion here, a prideful bewilderment. Lord, we're doing this. So why do you have no regard for us? Their appearances, it appears from the text, had actually deceived their very selves. And here is a jolting truth for us this morning. That a hypocrite rarely knows himself or herself to be a hypocrite. Isn't that the great terror of that picture that Jesus paints in Matthew 7? When on that day of judgment, many will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not? And he will say, I never knew you. These people are deceived and they deceive themselves. And their appearances have fooled even them. And I don't say that this morning to introduce fear and doubt and, and cast it into your heart. But I say that to cast you upon that self-examination that Scripture demands of us. I say that to cast you upon that self-examination of the psalmist. Who in the confidence of the gospel says in Psalm 139, search me and know me and find if there's any impure way in me. Brothers, do you know what a radical prayer that is? To say to the omniscient God, to say to the one who, who all things are light to him, search me and know me. Let me be completely transparent before your sight. What gives us the confidence to sing that, brothers and sisters, it is, it is only the gospel. Mm -hmm. And we need to cast ourselves there. We need to find ourselves there in light of this text to say, oh Lord, search me and know me because my heart can deceive even me. And I can be the worst of offenders and the worst of hypocrites. So Lord, search my heart and do that which I cannot. And show me my sinful ways. It's a duplicity that shows itself 
in self-deception, but it is also a duplicity that shows itself in the promotion of self. Look at what the prophet says in verse 3 and into verse 4. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Look at the words that are used here. You use your fast for what purpose? God is saying you use your fast to seek your own pleasure. You use your fast for selfishness. You use your fast, he says, at the end of verse 3, to oppress all your workers. You use your fast in verse 4 to quarrel. And you use your fast in verse 4 to fight. And you use your fast in verse 4 to hit with a wicked fist. The, the Lord is rebuking this people and bringing a, a very shocking indictment against them because they are a people who would use religious ordinances. They are a people who would use fasting, which is commanded of us, for the pursuit of selfish gain. To run over anybody that stands in their way to use their fasting and these observances as a means to an end. And the end is not the glory of God, but the end is themselves. As if they could rewrite that first question of our wonderful catechism. What is the chief end of man? They would desire to say the chief end of man is to glorify self and enjoy self forever. And for those of you who are familiar with the prophet Isaiah, you know that this is often emphasized by him. That Isaiah again and again and again tells us that our relationship with the Lord can be determined by how we treat our neighbor. Or to put it in these terms, how we observe and keep the first table of the law can be determined by how we keep the second table table of the law. You cannot love God and hate another. And Isaiah, or rather the Lord through Isaiah, is saying that is precisely what you are doing. You are using these religious observations for your own gain, for your own good, for your own pleasure. You end, you terminate in yourself. And it reveals the duplicity of these people. And what is the result of all of this? We see it in verse 5. And almost this mocking language from God. Is such the fast that I choose? Is that the fast that the Lord chooses? A fast that is focused only on outward forms. A fast that is, is born out of self-deception. A fast that promotes only self. God is saying, is that the fast that I choose? And the question begs all of us to answer with a resounding no. That is not the fast of God. That is not what God requires. That is not what God wants. That is not what God delights in. Friends, I have no joy this morning in a very real sense in preaching on the duplicity and the temptation towards hypocrisy in the church of Jesus Christ. It is an ugly monster that I wish had never shown its head in Adam's fallen race. But here it is. The double-heartedness of the people of God. And I don't just want to preach about it this morning. As if I was standing in a museum and showing you something that was behind a glass case saying, do not touch. If I could, I would preach these words straight into your heart. But I lack the power to do that. And my prayer is that the Spirit would open our eyes to these things. To put aside these pretenses. To put aside these outward forms. To, to put aside this promotion of self. And to give the Lord our hearts. 
And to come in humble repentance before him wherever these things manifest themselves in our lives. And I preach to you, brothers, to warn you. Because it belongs to our ministry in the pursuit of God's blessings to expose this kind of hypocrisy. To drag it out of the darkness and to bring it into the light of God's word. And to warn all those under our charge as those who are authorized to do so. To warn them, if you do not repent, you will perish in this sin. You must turn or you will Burn. And we desperately need to let that word fall first on our own hearts. The duplicity of this people. But finally, for a few brief moments, let us fix our eyes upon the Lord's delight. We see that drawn out in verses 6 and 7. The Lord says, is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? The Lord says, and in this question, asks of us to answer this in the positive. Yes, this is the fast that the Lord chooses. This is the fast that he approves of. This is the fast that he ultimately delights in. And you note, just in reading those words, the radically different character that the fast of God has as opposed to the fast of those hypocrites. It is a fasting whose means to an end is to benefit and be for the good of others. That's what God is saying here. This is the fast that I approve of. A fast which is a means to an end, and the end is doing good to others for my glory. And there's two things to note in these verses that the Lord delights in. And the first is liberty. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. You cannot read scripture honestly and not walk away with the overwhelming sense that our Lord, the one true and living God, has an extremely high regard for people who are oppressed. He has a great care and concern for the needy in this world. But we will do this text an injustice if we simply stop there. Because this is telling us something more. And we get the commentary, if you want to call it that, of this text from Jesus himself, who at the very beginning of his ministry preaches what has commonly been called the synagogue sermon, where he goes into the synagogue and he reads from the scrolls and he reads from Isaiah and he reads these words from Isaiah 58, verse 6, to let the oppressed go Free. And you remember what Jesus said. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Today, it has been fulfilled in your sight. When we see this language, as one author put it, what we actually have here is a constellation of metaphors for the preaching of the gospel. And Jesus is saying that ultimately Isaiah 58 verse 6 is fulfilled in him. It is realized in him. This is why he was sent forth. This is why he was given the spirit without measure. That he might bring to reality the very words of the fast that the Lord delights in. Is that not true? Is the gospel not a message to poor and needy sinners that there is a way of escape? Is the gospel of Jesus Christ not a a message to those who are oppressed and held in the chains and the bonds and the slavery of sin? That here is a way for those chains to be broken. Here is a way for the bonds of wickedness to fall powerless behind you. 
That, brothers, is the message of the gospel. And Jesus says that this is realized when we go forth and we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we preach the gospel to those who are in captivity and we tell them that their captors have been led in captivity by Jesus Christ. And we offer them the fullness of life and of happiness and of joy and of the liberating freedom that only the gospel can bring. And God is saying, there is the fast that I desire. There is the fast that I choose. The fast that ends there and promotes the gospel and the glory of Jesus Christ in all things. Brothers, the RPCNA needs to reclaim. We always stand in need of reclaiming the truth that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So fast. But in your fasting, promote this. Pray, but in all of your praying, promote this. That liberating and freeing gospel of Jesus Christ. And the second thing that the Lord delights in, we find it in verse 7, can simply be summed up in that one word of mercy. Is the fast that I choose, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. It's mercy. And is that not what God in Jesus Christ has done? Hope I don't step on any toes this morning, but I think the greatest question and answer in our shorter catechism is not question number one. It's question 20. Did God leave all mankind to perish? In that estate of sin and misery. And in a few words, the catechism is trying to convey a simple answer. No. God considered us in our miserable estate. And he has shown us abundant mercy. The Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 reminds us that the Lord is rich in mercy. Do you have a conceivable idea of what that actually means? That the riches and the wealth of God is his mercy. And the Lord is saying, there is the fast that I choose. To let your hearts beat with mine, to be merciful as I have been merciful. Because he is a God who loves and delights and joys. In showing mercy. So pray, brothers, but pray with this end in mind to be merciful and fast, but fast with this end in mind to show mercy to those who are in a pitiful, miserable state. You see, all that I'm saying, brothers, is this. That we are invited into this light and this healing and this righteousness and this glory that the prophet speaks of. We are invited into all of these blessings that are procured for us by Jesus Christ. And I want to remind you this morning that it is not necessary that the church should be weak and that the church should be ineffectual and that the church should be powerless and that the church should be feeble and poor and impoverished. Because Isaiah is guiding us there. The Lord is guiding us there. If you do this, he says in verse 8, then... Then shall your light break forth like the dawn. Then shall your light go forth and there will be none to hinder it. There will be none to slow its advance. There will be none who can fetter its rising. And I want to remind you, this is what we are called to as the church of Jesus Christ. Not to cower in the darkness, not to fear the shadows, but to let the light shine, to break forth in all of the blessings that God would bless us in, in Christ Jesus. But the road to that and the pathway to achieve that 
is to do what the Lord commands us to do, to delight ourselves in Him and to make His delights our delights, to proclaim liberty and to show mercy. And in that way, the prophet Isaiah is saying, you will come out of the darkness, you will come out of the nighttime, you will come out of the shadow. O oh, church of Jesus Christ, you were created for the day, and you were created for high noon, and you were created to let your light break forth like the dawn. So may we renew our interest in this. May we renew our ambition in this. May we be resolved brothers to go forth and to keep the fast that the Lord chooses. And when we do that with sincerity and integrity, we may stand and see what glorious things the Lord will do with the Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America. May our light break forth like the dawn. Amen. Let me pray. Lord, our desire is to see the church of Jesus Christ break forth like the dawn. Our desire is to come into the full enjoyment of the covenantal blessings that you have given us in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, make us faithful. That's what we pray for this morning, is faithfulness. We pray that we would go forth, even as the prophet Isaiah that we would cry aloud against the sins of this people. We pray that we would guard ourselves in the power of your spirit against a divided and double heart. And we do ask that your delight would be our delight, that we would learn to love the things that you love and to hate the things that you hate. Lord, our desire is that you would plan even greater days for the RPCNA. Our desire is not for our own acclaim, but our desire is that our better days would be for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen. amen. Praise be to God. Thank you, Pastor Borg, and uh, as the 